So yeah, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, another session. Of course, we are closing on day two, but I just wanted to give a quick introduction today to quantum machine learning uh, with the help of TensorFlow. So uh, just uh, before we start, how many of you know or are aware of machine, uh, I mean machine learning, let's say. And how many of you are aware of quantum computing and what quantum computing is all about? And how many of you are aware of quantum machine learning? Okay, so it looks like very few. So today we are going to be deciphering what exactly is quantum machine learning. So it will be a very uh, beginner-friendly uh, session. So thanks for uh, that quick word of hands for uh, letting us know that what's the audience like today. Uh, so yeah, uh, without wasting any further time, let's get started. So I'm Shivai. I'm a developer advocate at MilliSearch, and uh, with me it's Rashid. Hello, I'm Rashid, uh, and I study CS at the University of Toronto, and I also do academic research in the intersection of deep learning and computer vision. So the, so I've been contributing quite a lot to CERC and uh, Shivai has been contributing quite a lot to TensorFlow Quantum, which is built on top of CERC. So we, yeah, we'll also talk about these projects. That's like a sneak peek for what's about to come. And of course, I just wanted to first of all start off with what, what this particular talk is, who, who this talk is for. So of course, uh, I kind of did that survey. So whether you're a machine learning engineer and you're interested in quantum computing, or you're just a software engineer willing to get into quantum computing, or of course, you want to go all the way advanced towards becoming a quantum computing based machine learning engineer, uh, that's QML, that's quantum machine learning. Uh, this talk will be for you. So again, as I mentioned, uh, this is a beginner friendly talk and we'll be covering all the way from what exactly is quantum computing for those folks who are not aware of it and how you can apply that to machine learning principles. How is it different from, let's say, your classical machine learning algorithms and how we can actually use the intersection of both the core concepts of quantum computing and machine learning and be able to build machine learning models. So yeah, without wasting any further time, let's get started. Yeah, so we'll start with uh quick introduction and uh, this is mainly because this is more of an open source focused conference and um, a lot of cloud native folks uh, including myself uh, so yeah I'll just uh, start by talking a bit about the fundamentals behind building CERC or even building TensorFlow Quantum so um, so standard computers usually work with ones and zeros and any kind of bits you have are either ones or zeros. And uh, the fundamental idea, uh, oh, also, uh, since this is up there, uh, this talk will be from a software perspective. So there will be no math, uh, so to say. And uh, we have had other talks with a bit of heavy math, for sure. but this will be from the software perspective. And um, what a qubit does is it takes this word, uh, when a qubit exists, uh, it can be uh, it, it it can be up with some probability and uh, one with some probability, zero with some probability. And when you measure it, it's either one or it's zero. But when it's when it exists and you're not measuring it, it could be one with some probability and zero with some probability. That seems a bit odd and. Uh, that also might seem, if you're, especially if you're from the software background, it might seem like, how, how do you make use of this, or how do you exploit this fact? So, but, but yeah, we'll talk about that. Uh, so, so that's what, uh, and that's what you, uh, and that's what you call a qubit, very fundamentally. Uh, uh, let's also talk about gates. So. Uh, once we talk about gates, I think you'll have a better idea of why this even exists. So, very simply, a gate is a two cross n cross two cross n matrix, and uh, so the n over here is how many bits you are work making it work on. So, ideally, not gates work on a single bit, uh, an AND gate works on two bits, and so on. Simple stuff, and. Uh, there are also some special properties for this matrix. It should be invertible and so on. Let's not talk about that. Uh, let's keep it from the software perspective. And here is an uh, interesting case of simple matrix multiplication as a gate. 
So, so what you essentially want to do when applying a gate to a bit or a qubit is identify the standard basis vectors of the gate and um, th that, that essentially tells you what the gate will compute. And uh, just like traditional software, uh, using and not or stuff like that, we can pretty much build all of software today. And um, it's pretty similar. You can perform multiple operations using gates and then complementing gates. You can also build, uh, just as a starting exercise, it's pretty easy to start building with a two-bit adder. I assume most of you might have done that in college with and or not gates built a two-bit adder. It's pretty simple to do that. Uh, and uh, so so what this does is I've just taken a qubit and uh, applied a gate to it. Th this gate is uh, this gate is simply for element-wise matrix multiplication, but a gate could be for anything. And um, yeah, I just wanted you to see from this kind of animation that you are trying to transform stuff in some way. And you put together multiple of these gates and you end up with a circuit. And uh, circuits is what we'll be using. And if the name sounds familiar to you, I was talking about circ and contributing a bit to it. Uh, so this is what circ makes particularly easy for you. So you can build these kinds of circuits pretty easily with circ. And uh, we'll also talk about that. But this is what a circuit looks like, pretty similar to how standard and how we do stuff in standard software and uh, all of the a b a b c's are gates and uh, at a particular slice of it that's what we'll call moment so that's like a moment in time think of it that way so uh, okay that's enough of beating around the bush and uh, let's start talking about why this is faster or why you should even think about this so I make the claim that this is exponentially faster. It seems interesting. But I make the claim that this is exponentially faster, uh, which is not fully true. This is exponentially faster if you know how to exploit duality. So let's take a look at this. And uh, I'll again be using some animation. So the main reason I use animation is so I don't have to write equations and explain them. It's hard to do that on a screen. Uh, and especially in a software conference. Okay, so let's start by saying that we have two bits. These could be anything. Uh, you could have zero, one, one, zero, anything. We have two separate bits independent of each other. And uh, so the first step you do is you entangle qubits. And uh, what do you mean by entangle qubits is, well, we'll see that. And then we give these two qubits to two different people. So starts becoming much like a communication problem like you would have seen earlier. So what we want to do is uh, see all of these steps and how it works out. There's also, we'll not go into the detail of especially how the encoding part works, uh, but, but there's like enough documentation talking about that. I just want to fundamentally explain the idea. So this is the kind of qubit we have and um, these are the different states we have. So let's say we are working with a qubit one zero. So this is what it looks like and we pass it through some gate and right now let's just say that there is there exists some kind of circuit that does the encoding for me. So uh, so for, for, for the example we were just seeing, uh, I was able to make this circuit and that allows me to encode this qubit. So the, so now I have some way be with some circuit, uh, the circuit just flashed there, but with some circuit, I've been able to transform two qubits, uh, two bits into a single qubit. So, so those are the B1s and B2s I had. And finally, we have a state for which we have another circuit. And you go through the circuit uh, like I'm showing here. And... Um, you finally have an encoding. So the way this, uh, so the way this encoding uh, works is using multiple circuits, uh, which I just manually built for this example. But 
let's just say you have these circuits and once you have a qubit uh, you measure the qubit once you measure the qubit it's either one or zero so our friend here uh, who wants to receive these two qubits gets to uh, gets to uh, gets those qubits and i guess that went a bit fast but when you get these qubits uh, you run a decoder on it and the decoder is again a circuit and here is where the entangling part becomes pretty useful um, so we say that if the two qubits are entangled which was our first step you will be always uh, you'll have like a nice circuit to decode that and once you decode that with a single qubit you end up getting two bits of information so there were two people one had two bits he uh, they were able to transfer a single qubit and send over two bits of information seems fundamentally correct at the moment uh, there is a bit of the encoding decoding part which we have skipped through but uh, I, I hope that makes sense how um, how you get from one qubit to transporting uh, two bits of information. And um, this is also another example what just a few qubits could do. And uh, you you are uh, and you can you can most certainly see that you have two raised to n number of states. So each qubit could carry two bits and you have two raised to n uh, states you can now represent and let's say if we, i just wanted to build this circuit or any kind of circuit um circ makes it particularly easy for me and um, this is also what we'll talk about uh, in a while these are the projects we have been working with and that's the motivation for the talk so we'll talk about this but it makes this process of getting the circuit doing the encoding part decoding part particularly easy so i could start using the benefits of 2 raised to n and so this is more of a start i like to use for publicity and uh, there's a bit of gotcha with this start uh, so but this is like a pretty famous start uh, and a lot of people code this there's a bit of a gotcha which is this represents the number of states and uh, uh, but but it's still interesting to see <laughs> so i'll say this anyway uh, so 300 bits are not even enough to store one image and you have 300 qubits and you could have the number of particles in the universe uh, this again this is the number of states um, and at, at first it might seem a bit misleading uh, but so yeah, so of course, like that is a bit of, bit of a primer to what exactly is uh, quantum computing itself. And again, if that might have been a bit too much, uh, it it happens to everyone. It happened to me. It took me around like two to three months to really just understand the entire quantum entanglement and all the physics and math behind it. But uh, yeah, I mean, we'll be sharing some resources after this talk so that you can all get started. Uh, but of course, coming to the main topic for today's presentation, and that's quantum machine learning. So applying the same principles that fundamentally define how quantum computing works, but to the entire landscape of machine learning. And primarily what you will see is that we are going to be using the lot of the concept of the quantum circuits uh, to find the patterns and the relationships within our data. And that can be applied to whatever data set that you might actually use. And we'll see that how you can actually use your standard data sets, how they can get converted into a circuit. and. Uh, by using TensorFlow Quantum, you can actually run your standard Keras or TensorFlow-based machine learning models on top of this particular data. And these quantum circuits are essentially as they find these patterns and with any typical machine learning algorithm, how you are able to find patterns in your data and then you can use it to find further new patterns instead of any new data that you introduce to it to find certain predictions. That's what is essentially being done with the help of these quantum circuits. They are sort of replacing your normal tensors, right? And of course, we'll be representing these circuits with the help of tensors within uh, TensorFlow when we define that. So with the help of these patterns, these quantum circuits can make predictions about your new data. 
and uh, one thing that of course my co-presenter rishit covered was about duality right so how can we actually ex exploit this duality with the help of qml so primarily if we look at uh, how fundamentally quantum computing works right there are primarily two different things so one is quantum interference that means uh, like how you have different type of waves that might collide with each other or they might add up to each other right so let's say that we are representing these uh, quantum states as waves so if these waves collide with each other they might suppress or if they of course amplify each other that will uh, raise the state right so that can actually lead to more accurate predictions uh, and better classification so if you are using a quantum machine learning algorithm for let's say classifying a binary classification uh, this quantum interference actually does help with that and the other one is superposition so quantum superposition is also another very well known concept so the idea is that if you have multiple qubits in this superposition then that also does enhance the overall parallel computation uh, for uh, your machine learning algorithms and we know that parallel computation especially in terms of like machine learning uh, is very useful to be able to make faster predictions so primarily if you are using something like these core concepts of com of quantum computing whether it's interference or its superposition those can help you to exploit the duality uh, again duality means that your state could represent could be represented either in zero or in one so that's how you exploit uh, duality for quantum machine learning and uh, we'll now talk about how you can actually leverage the use of hybrid models yeah so most of my work has been around machine learning and uh, when i started exploring this area i started knowing about these projects using them um, I, i i saw a fundamental mismatch which is it wouldn't be faster uh, for just like classic image recognition stuff that i had been researching on and um, so i started uh, researching more about hybrid models and this is like quite a while ago um but so this is where the motivation for hybrid models comes in and uh, this is also what uh, uh, what the projects will be talking about open source projects will be talking about help you do better so we want to use the idea of qubits for the ops for which it is faster and uh, these would often be op, uh, and these would often be ops where we can exploit the principle of superposition but for all the other ops uh, it doesn't seem to necessarily be faster and uh, we would still be handling like the same uh, same amount of data and uh, uh we're spending the uh, same amount of compute probably even more um if used incorrectly so this is where the idea of hybrid models comes in um we we can use uh, we can we can use these ops for, for for quantum data or where we can exploit superposition and for rest of the parts we could just use classic machine learning or software techniques and this is how it seems to also work out the best uh brings a be uh, makes the best use of superposition principles and also makes use of standard neural networks so we do the thing and combine them uh so the, the, so this is an interesting image and uh, i just want you to take out a bit from it which is think about all of this as a single circuit to start out with and uh, so so this is the kind of circuit we want to build um, probably with circ uh, to make like understanding all of this easier uh, and so so the, so we also have a quantum model uh, which is essentially just a circuit and we want to change the gradients for it uh, so the so the standard idea is same we use the cost function uh, to change the gradients uh, for, for for the quantum model we have and we also then need a classical model because the parts of uh making classical inference uh is way faster and way better by a standard neural network so you are essentially solving a two network problem uh and we want to minimize the cost function so this becomes like a standard optimization problem and uh yeah you could pretty much easily reduce this to a standard optimization problem if you also notice there's a lot of these kinds of techniques where you 
optimize two neural networks at once in, re in response to a single cost function uh, in standard machine learning stuff. Uh, a, a lot of the motivation for GANs and VAEs uh, essentially came from uh, from pitching to from pitching two networks against each other, which is not of course uh, which is not always the case here, but draws a nice parallel uh, to classical machine learning stuff. And uh, do you yeah, want to talk kind a bit? Of, uh, brings us to what's the main difference between uh, quantum machine learning as compared to your standard machine learning algorithms. So primarily, uh, the way that uh, I'll kind of break this down into two parts. So the first one is how the different type of algorithms deal with the data, right? So of course, my fellow presenter spoke about how you can actually use quantum data. So as when you talk about your standard machine learning algorithms, uh, the data set can be of any type, right? You might be representing your data set uh, as, let's say, some images or some videos. But ultimately, it's in the form of bytes. Now, typically, when you're talking about your quantum machine learning uh, algorithms and the data they're dealing with, again, as the data is quantum data, you're essentially dealing with states. So whether it's uh, represented as, let's say, zeros or ones, and all the different range of values that can exist between them. So this particular diagram kind of showcases the difference between um, and a standard example, so if you look at the CML, that's basically your classical machine learning on the left-hand side. So you have uh, three bits that you're taking in as an input and you're getting as an output. But uh, when you're using, let's say, something like a quantum machine learning, uh, you are essentially having three qubits. And as we know, that that would essentially mean two to the power n number of different possible states. And all of these different states will kind of be utilized inside of the machine learning algorithm uh, where you're dealing with that states essentially. And uh, you are converting your standard data into the quantum definition uh, by transferring it through this quantum machine learning process. And we'll see that how this kind of correlates when we talk about some examples with the hybrid models that uh, my co-presenter spoke about. And the other way that uh, they are fundamentally different is uh, as of course, I mean, it makes, makes sense that the QML algorithms are primarily designed to run on quantum systems, right? So if we kind of look at one of the examples of one of the most well-known uh, QML, and that's quantum machine learning algorithms, that's the Shor's algorithm, that runs exponentially faster with the help of QML uh, as compared to your standard machine learning algorithms. And that's primarily, again, because of the way that we deal with this multiple states uh, inside of any kind of a machine learning algorithm that's running uh, with the quantum entanglement and using a concepts like superposition. Uh, but yeah, that kind of uh, will bring us to the circ. Sure. So uh, yeah, we'll now start uh, introducing the projects and uh, probably also start talking about uh, how you implement this stuff. Uh, though the detail was a bit shallow, uh, we'll start by talking about the projects. I've majorly been working on Cirque, uh, contributing and writing a few of the APIs for Cirque. And Cirque allows you to uh, mix this part of circuits, which you heard quite often, uh, and was even the basis of what we are doing uh, to build the overall models. So it makes writing, manipula manipulating, and optimizing the circuits pretty easy. So I also talked about doing kind of gradient descent uh, on uh, on the quantum model. And uh, the way this would work is, well, it's still gradient descent, but the parameters you update are different than your standard models. So SOC makes, easy, uh, make the, makes these easier. And uh, I unfortunately also don't have a quantum computer. so. So it makes the simulation part easier as well. Uh, but but uh, so this so this is like a quick example uh, of Cirque and uh, kind of the basic building blocks that we'll be using multiple times. Um, so in in a while, uh, Shwai I think will be talking about TensorFlow Quantum. Yeah. So sh sh TensorFlow Quantum uses Cirque for manipulating. Uh, for manipulating and creating these circuits, creating the DAGs that uh, build these. So, so this is uh, essentially how qubits are handled and how gates are made. So this is a pretty simple example. Uh, and uh, I show this in two parts because that's how it is represented in memory. 
uh, we have all of these moments which are slices uh, what what happens at a particular moment in time and uh, so this example just adds a not gate uh, to the next of uh, after uh, after the uh, after the two inputs we have and uh, you all, it also may allows you to implement these not gates and all other kinds of gates very easily which we'll often use yeah and then that basically brings us to tensorflow quantum so tensorflow quantum is an open source project by google it was released in 2020 uh, and it's essentially been on, built on top of circ so whatever uh, analysis that you do you are essentially building these circuits and tensorflow quantum layer uh, kind of adds the layer of tensorflow on top of it so some of the big benefits that uh, you get by using a tool or a framework like tensorflow quantum is first of all it removes a lot of the abstraction layers for you when you're dealing with machine learning algorithms. So a lot of the compute, uh, mathematical compute that you have to normally write, TensorFlow does away with those. And uh, one of the other benefits is that, um, that I kind of also covered earlier, was that, um, and I'll talk about this more as we will share like a live coding example, is uh, that if you look at your standard TensorFlow, right? So we have Keras. So a lot of the Keras functions that typically machine learning engineers might use, uh, the TensorFlow Quantum actually allows you to use those same set of functions on top of your uh, standard compute as well. So if you're having a quantum data set, you can very easily use your standard Keras functions. So that means if you're using something like model.fit or model.compile, which a lot of you, if you are dealing with TensorFlow or you're working with Keras, you might have actually used these tools. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel and use some completely new functions. You can directly just use these same functions with your quantum data set as well. Now, if you look at the second line, I have used some asterisk. And that is because uh, it's not entirely true. There are some other changes that you have to make. Of course, especially the ones where we spoke about that with quantum mechanics, you deal with states. So the data that you're essentially dealing with, you are dealing with states and not just regular bits or qubits. So the only things that you'll have to make uh, in your overall machine learning algorithm and your, in, in your entire program will be to deal with these states and convert your uh, circuits that we spoke about, that's because we are using circ, to convert these uh, circuits into tensors. And then of course you can still use your regular machine learning model functions such as uh, your compile or dot, uh, fit to be able to fit your model to any of the data set that you're dealing with. So we'll see this in a stepwise manner. Uh, we have uh, two code demos uh, ready for all of you to kind of walk through of how this entire process works. So just stay with us. Uh, but yeah, uh, primarily as I mentioned that uh, since the circ library and TensorFlow are very closely related, uh, we are, as I mentioned, that we are going to be representing these circuits as tensors. And the second one is that we are going to be classifying our data that will be used. So we have prepared a classification algorithm that uh, we are going to be using to demonstrate this entire process. And uh, of course, uh, with TensorFlow Quantum, you can also uh, introduce parallelism to your code. So if you're dealing with larger data sets, you can run each and every individual uh, test parallelly as well. So whether you're training your algorithm or for, in, uh, for basically uh, doing the inference part, uh, TensorFlow Quantum does allow for parallelism as well. So we'll not go too deep into it, but it does allow if you are interested in that kind of a use case. So well, uh, over to the demo time. So we are running these particular programs uh, inside of a GitHub code space. Uh, so shout out to GitHub. Uh, but um, like, if you look at the TensorFlow uh, quantum official GitHub repository, there are a lot of different code samples that are already there. Uh, we could not actually use the Google Collab because unfortunately, uh, the TensorFlow quantum project only supports Python versions 3.7, 3.8, and 3.9. And by default, if you try to run it on a code, uh, on a, a Collab, uh, nowadays, Google Collab actually only supports versions 3.10. So either you might have to install a separate version of uh, uh, the Python, which is like anything between 3.7 to 3.9. And also do ensure that you, uh, with the current release of the TensorFlow Quantum, which is 0.7.2, it only supports TensorFlow versions 2.7 and below. So uh, just some prerequisites to keep in mind if you want to try these on your own. But we'll be sharing some links at the end of the session so that all of you can actually try it out. So over here, I have my first notebook. So the first notebook, if you see, is um, 
primarily if you want to get started, you will have to install three main dependencies. So you have TensorFlow. Uh, again, just very simply pip install TensorFlow. Then you have circ. So you'll just have to do pip install circ. And you'll have to do uh, pip install TensorFlow hyphen quantum to use the TensorFlow quantum library. So these are just the prerequisites that you will require. Uh, one important dependency that you'll see over here in the line number three that you see is uh, the SVG circuit. So you can actually uh, generate SVC, uh, SVG images uh, to see how your circuit looks like, which, of course, uh, Rishit showcased in the entire demonstration during the slides. So those were generated using the SVC circuit. Uh, so the first step that you'll see is that after we have imported... Uh, so, sorry yeah. for the... Uh, cut in, but uh, so, sorry, but those were actually generated using Manim, Manim I, yes. I think, on the stage. Uh, but what you'll see is that uh, some of these other images that you see, these are, you can generate them using SEC as well. Okay, so the first step that we'll do is that we'll import the dependencies, and once we have done that, so this is where we are first uh, defining our circuit. Now, the one of the methods that you see over here is the grid qubit. So, circ actually has uh, multiple methods using which you can generate your circuits. So one that we have actually used is the grid qubit, but there are a few other ones that if you look at the documentation, uh, you can define your circuit, your initial circuit in any different method that you want. And over here, we have just placed it at the coordinate 0, 0. So then we uh, create the circuit. So uh, I mean, that will help you to create your uh, circuit. So we'll just go ahead and run this. And once uh, you have created a circuit, so this is where uh, now we are using the TensorFlow quantum. So the TensorFlow quantum uh, comes with a convert to tensor function, uh, which will take your circuit and convert it into a tensor. So if I go ahead and run this, uh, the first thing that you see is that um, right now, of course, we are not doing anything with the actual converted tensor. But this is the actual representation of our circuit, which is at the coordinate 0, 0. And if you look at my, if I go ahead and actually print uh, the circuit over here, you can see that that's how it looks uh, like, you know, in the representation of a tensor. But if I also change it to the tensor circuit, which is our converted tensor, uh, I'll go ahead and run this. So this is like how you would any standard TensorFlow tensor would look like, right? So we have just converted our circuit into a tensor with the help of the convert to tensor a function that is provided by uh, the uh, TensorFlow quantum. So of course, this was just the first uh, program that where we would want to show, show you that once you create a circuit with the help of circ, how easily you can actually just convert it into a tensor with the help of TensorFlow quantum. Uh, Rish, do you want to probably add something to this program? Anything that you might want to add? Uh, no, these are pretty much just like the circuits uh, we we saw in the slides, and uh, yeah. All right, so we'll move on to the next uh, demo. So this demo actually is, uh, this program is going to be classifying, uh, It's th think of this as a binary classification where we're using like an SVN-like program, uh, SVN-like machine learning algorithm, and we'll be looking at how you can also track your entire uh, loss function and your uh, loss function as well. So this kind of will give you an end-to-end -end example of how you can actually leverage the use of a circuit and then train it in a classical machine learning fashion that you might do with your normal data or your reg regular data. So over here, we have just imported all of our dependencies. Uh, the one that we have also imported is matplotlib to plot our loss function. Um, so. After this, what we do is that, uh, so first of all, this is our main function. Again, I'll not go too deep into explaining all of this, but in a nutshell, uh, this particular make data function is essentially used for generating our quantum data. So what you'll also see is that, again, we are initializing our circ uh, library over here to create a circuit. And again, we are doing a number of different uh, uh, additions on top of our data. So of course, what you can do with your circuit is that once you have created your circuit, you can uh, very easily transform that data inside of it. So whether you want to use something like um, you want to change the axis, right? Because uh, with circuits, you can deal with not just X, X and Y, you can deal with X, Y, and Z coordinates as well. So we have, we have just gone ahead and uh, done a bunch of uh, optimizations to our data to create a circuit. And I'll just go ahead and run this. And then the next one is where we're actually now creating a parameterized quantum circuit. And uh, Rishid, do you want to probably talk more about the parameterized quantum circuit? Sure. Uh, so, so essentially, what we want to do is uh, 
also have some learnable parameters uh, over here and uh, and not just the kind of circuits we see we also want to do some kind of gradient descent on this uh, so so that so that's the uh, so that's the reason why we use parameterized quantum circuits and uh, uh, another thing to uh, kind of note over here uh, is there's also some bit of data management that goes on if you were to actually run the circ stuff in uh, on a real quantum computer and uh, uh, we actually have one at the university and I've done a lot of experiments with that so we kind of skip through a lot of the data management stuff if you were to actually run it on a uh, quantum computer a lot of what we are doing here is in eager mode and uh, at least for the title of this talk, I think that's justified. Yeah. And of course, like since you're running this in a Google Collab or, for example, in a GitHub code space rather than running it on top of an actual uh, quantum computer. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we are primarily creating a paradigmized quantum circuit that will allow us to add learnable attributes to our circuit so that we can actually use it instead of a machine learning algorithm. And uh, then what we are doing is, um, of course, like now this probably might be familiar to all the machine learning folks where we are just defining the accuracy function that will be utilized on top of this circuit that we have defined. And uh, then over here, what we'll do is uh, we'll break our quantum data into the training and our testing data. So training will be used for uh, primarily for fitting our model on top of our data and then the testing to look at our loss function and see how the model has performed over the course of the entire training. And uh, here, then what we have done is um, we have gone ahead and defined our qubit. So if you might have seen the previous example, we had used the grid qubit to create like a, a qubit. So we have gone ahead and done that. And uh, we have created our PQC, uh, that's our patronized uh, quantum uh, computing model. And uh, finally, what you'll see is uh, that we have compiled our model. So as I mentioned earlier, that with uh, quantum uh, tensorflow quantum you can still use your standard keras based functions after you have actually converted your uh, circuits into your tensors so you can still use your normal uh, machine learning model uh, algorithms so over here we are basically compiling and using the atom optimizer uh, again very standard stuff you if you are from a machine learning background and we have just gone ahead and fit our model on top of our quantum uh, training data right and you can see that uh, we have all these different epochs uh, i'll probably just run it uh, uh, because it's just running a few times so it's going ahead and training and uh, finally what we are doing is that we are just plotting our uh, data so of course uh, we are plotting both our training and our validation loss uh, that you'll again see in any standard machine learning algorithm and you can see that over the course of all these different uh, epochs uh, how it has actually fared over top over here so I mean yeah, the main idea to showcase is that you can leverage the use of either regular data and then of course generate the circuits from top of it and use your regular machine learning workflow very easily with the help of this um, you also actually have another example but yeah before uh, that Rishit, if you want to sure so uh, i just want uh, so uh, so these demos were created by show but i just wanted to add that uh, uh, so the, so the reason why we have a similar kind of loss and optimization strategy is because all of these are, if you think about it, all of the loss uh, and the optimization is actually running on just standard accuracy, uh, just standard bits. And uh, we, are, we are not necessarily uh, thinking about the qubit perspective uh, when doing the optimization. And uh, which is why we can still, uh, still use standard loss functions and standard optimization strategies. And yeah, here's like another example because we are running slightly over time. Uh, but here's like another example of using um, the QNNs with the help of MNIST dataset, which again a lot of you might be familiar with. Um, so yeah, I mean we'll be happy to share these notebooks with everyone um, at the end of the session. So feel free to connect with us. But yeah, the main idea was to demonstrate how you can leverage the same set of tools that you use for your regular machine learning purposes. But of course, you add now uh, your quantum data, and of course, we're dealing with states and circuits instead of your regular uh, data that you might deal with the regular machine learning algorithm. But uh, what I'll do is, um, of course, after this, we'll also talk a bit about what's the current status of 
quantum machine learning itself, right? So just as a primer, a lot of the quantum machine learning that we see right now is still under research phase. So there is very little to no actual applications that you might see that have a very widespread industrial use. So a lot of the things that you see are still being researched upon. But of course, a lot of the different companies, including like Google, IBM, all the major world's bigger companies, they today do support uh, quantum computing and quantum machine learning. Uh, so there is like Qiskit by IBM. Of course, Google has their open source project called Quantum. Um, so some of the main research focus areas is also like you know dr drug discovery. So with the help of uh, QML algorithms, you can very easily find out about uh, large uh, drug mod modules, and then you can actually classify between between them. And so that's one major area where you actually see quantum, uh, quantum machine learning uh, being used right now. And apart from that, uh, IBM recently just uh, started to use a lot of the quantum machine learning, especially with Qiskit project. It's an open source framework, again, similar to uh, the machine learning framework by um, TensorFlow Quantum, right? So similar to uh, TensorFlow Quantum. And they are leveraging it to use for NLG, that's natural language generation. And uh, another area where you might find it is in financial modeling as well. So these are some of the areas where there is a lot of current uh, research going on. And what we have also found out is that it is a lot more optimized as compared to your standard uh, machine learning that you might actually use. But again, that does come with a caveat that uh, it's not always going to be faster than your regular uh, machine learning algorithms but of course there are these, these are some of the areas we have find where we found that it is a lot faster and if we look at the future scope as well uh, so of course a lot of the research that we are doing in all these particular areas it's there but apart from that you'll also see it a lot in material sciences as well and rich if you want to add something to it yeah, i think we are good all right perfect so yeah uh, with that we'll uh, conclude and we'll be open to questions now also, if you want to ask us about contributing to any of these open source projects, uh, feel free to. And uh, if, if not, uh, that's all for today. Thanks. Two related questions. One, you said you you need to run a transformation of the data to a quantum uh, enabled data, or like whatever, right? Regular data to quantum enabled data, or whatever. Uh, it, I'm assuming that's standard compute, not necessarily quantum compute, right? You don't need a quantum computer to do that transformation, but that is also cost, right? Associated with your model. Yes. So. Like I know you're, I know you're saying that the, the 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 algorithm itself runs exponentially faster. I'm assuming that cost plays some part into the into that particular equation. So, is there a particular point at which it becomes? Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so sense, yeah. the question uh, asked was, uh, we also do some transformations on the data uh, beforehand, uh, and how well does that factor into the cost, and how is the effect of that? So um, so for the demos, maybe sure, I could talk about that. But in general, uh, so any demos we run right now, uh, even though I was not building those, I could say that they were definitely slower than classical algorithms. Uh, I'm probably sure that's the case for the demos you showed as well. Yeah, so they are, uh, yeah, they are still slower than classical algorithms, and that's because um, the cost of transforming that data is huge, and uh, the gains you get in a simulation are not so much. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, but let's talk about the ideal scenario, and at least in what I've experienced. Uh, the the cost as so what you would often use it for is find avenues where the data is already in the qubit states you want and um, that is one of the main areas where you would probably efficiently be able to apply it and uh, for a lot of classical uh, for a lot of classical data sets uh, it, it seems it's hard to apply to it right now and that's what i've seen uh, from my experience, but 
sure if you want to talk about the demos or anything else no i mean uh, completely agree and that's why i mentioned that a lot of the particular research that's going on right now especially in the drug discovery phase right uh, so they are in that process of converting that entire classical data set that might have for let's say the drug models and converting it to the qubits so that process of course does take a lot of compute and might add up to our claim that we made initially that it will be faster. But as I just mentioned that once we get our data in the qubit format, then of course it will be a lot faster. If you take away that main uh, conversion step, then it will be a lot faster as compared to your standard algorithms. I think that's all, so thank you.